Amen. You may be seated. This morning's scripture is taken from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Promises are like glass, beautiful until they shatter. I read that quotation somewhere recently, and although I was unsuccessful in tracking down who actually said it originally, the words have stuck with me. Promises are like glass, beautiful until they shatter. The reality of our lives is that we live in a fallen world, a world of broken promises. If I were to ask you, and I'm not going to, but if I were to ask, I would venture that every person here has either been the victim of a broken promise or has broken a promise themselves, or most likely both of those things. We see broken promises all of the time in our political system, in our sports culture, and even, sadly, in churches. And because we live in this world of shattered promises, over time, I think we as human beings tend to stop believing that promises can actually be kept. Today's scripture stands in opposition to that belief when it comes to the promises that God makes to us. It's all about God's faithfulness in keeping those promises that God makes. The bedrock of the Christian faith is being able to stand on the promises of God. They sing a whole hymn about that over in the traditional service. God promises us so many things, rest and direction and grace and peace and hope and that we will never walk alone, just to name a few. But if you haven't experienced a broken promise... If you have lived through someone on earth hurting you that way, it can be challenging, to say the least, to trust anyone to ever keep a promise again, and that anyone includes God. And when we have our trust broken, it can seem like standing on the promises of God is less like standing on a solid rock and more like standing on that thin layer of ice that still precariously covers the surface of a lake at the very end of winter. So in a world of broken human promises, how can we know for sure that God keeps the promises that God makes? For that, we turn to today's scripture. And the first thing we read in that scripture, or we heard Susan read in that scripture, is the reminder of God's promise to Abraham. Abraham was one of the first people to be a recipient of God's promise. Abraham had a great relationship with God. It was so good, in fact, that God had promised Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. And then later, that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars. God and Abraham were so tight that God promised that Abraham and his descendants were going to be foundational to the kingdom of God here on earth. There was only one problem with this promise. The first time that God made that pledge to Abraham was when Abraham was already 75 years old. And at that point in his life, he was childless. Abraham and his wife Sarah had gotten to that older age without children. And even though they believed in God, and even though they had faith in God, you can see that in the scriptures, I think that all hope for that part of God's promise for the descendants to come may have seemed lost at that point. 
But then in God's own timing, God appeared to Abraham a second time and a third time about this same promise, reassuring Abraham that it would come true. God said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. Your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son. And you know what Abraham's response was to this incredible news? He laughed. He laid face down on the ground and he laughed. And then when Sarah heard the news, she laughed too. Because who would not laugh when you are now 100 years old like Abraham was and 90 years old like Sarah was and someone, even when that someone is God, says to you, you're going to have a child. But that's exactly what happened. When Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, she did indeed give birth to a son and they named him Isaac. And as an aside, that has absolutely nothing to do with anything that I'm going to say for the rest of the sermon. Do you know what Isaac means? One who laughs, yes. Which I think is such a fitting name for a child who came into the world on the heels of his parents' laughter. Isaac is the start of a fulfillment of a promise that God made to Abraham. This is the story that's referenced in the first part of today's scripture when it says, when God made his promise to Abraham saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. God made a promise and God made good on that promise. God kept his word and God did it in his time. And here's the thing about that promise. I don't know if you caught it when Susan read it. So let me read the first verse of today's passage for you again. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. God swore by himself. That seems like such a funny detail, and really, what does it mean? God swore by himself. Well, let's pair it with a verse that comes after the reference to Abraham to help us understand its meaning. So if you put those two verses together, it says this. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. People swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. How many of you, in an effort to convince someone that your word is true, have ever said, get me a stack of Bibles and I will swear on them? Okay, so just me. All right, I've done it a few times, got to convince other people. Or think of your favorite courtroom drama. And before a witness takes the stand, what do they have to say? They raise their right hand, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. When people swear on a stack of Bibles or take an oath on God's name, we do that so that the people present who are witnessing that know how serious we are. They know that we are about to say something that should be trusted. And like the scripture says, that oath, when sworn to a higher power, puts an end to all argument. The dilemma for God is that God can't swear on anyone higher because there is no one higher than God. But because God understands just how important it is for us humans to get that guarantee God takes that extra step anyway in order to end all argument about what God says. And since there is no one higher, God swears on himself. And we as Christians take that to heart, and we must believe then that what God says is true. So we have an example of God keeping a pretty big promise to Abraham, and we've seen that God will go the extra mile to reassure us that we can fully believe that what God says is true. And those two things separately, but especially together, should be enough for us to believe that God keeps his promises. It should be. But one of the things I love most about God is that God knows us so well and so intimately that God knows sometimes even that is not enough. We read in scripture that God promised us peace that passes all understanding and comfort and strength that moves mountains. But sometimes when we are going through the most painful things life can throw at us and we are broken and the tears won't stop and it seems like those promises God made for peace and for comfort and for strength were all just empty words and we are on our knees crying out to God from our broken hearts, where are you? 
the last thing we feel is that God is keeping those promises. And so the writer of Hebrews ends the passage we heard today with the reassurance we need. It says, We who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. Did you know that in biblical times, people fleeing for their lives could run to a place of worship and take hold of the altar, and that once they grabbed it, they were safe from whoever was pursuing them? The people who were pursuing them couldn't touch them. It's all in 1 Kings chapter 1. In our world today, we not, may not be fleeing from actual people who want to kill us like in ancient times, but consider the power of the image of fleeing to that altar of God and holding on tight with hope because you have a refuge there, that God will protect you and that God will keep you safe when you are in the presence of God. It is a powerful image of hope. And then there's the image of an anchor that was often used as a symbol of hope in the Christian faith from the earliest of times because of what an anchor does. It keeps a boat from straying too far from where it's supposed to be, right? Pretty simple. And there are two things about an anchor that are important to understand in the context of hope. The first is that even when the anchor is down, the boat still moves. The current the wake of other passing boats, waves, all of these things can cause a boat to move around even when it's tied to an anchor. But when the anchor is down, you know it can't go far from it. Our hope works the same way. When we anchor our hope in Jesus, it does not mean that we are not going to get tossed around by life a little bit or maybe even a lot. It's just that we know that ultimately our hope in Jesus Christ is the anchor that will hold us firm and secure. And the second thing about an anchor is that it's often placed away from the boat. For example, in biblical times when a boat was in a harbor, sailors would carry the anchor away from the boat and they would put it on the shore or secure it to the dock in order to keep that boat right where it was supposed to be. And in our scripture, hope has entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, entered on our behalf. I read from a commentary this week that beautifully explained the importance of this image of hope being in the inner sanctuary. It said that just as the anchor which holds a ship is not exactly in the same place as the ship itself, our hope, not in this world. Rather, it is in a holier and greater place. And it went on to say in these last two verses, we have this powerful reassurance that Christ has anchored our hope of refuge in the very presence of God, that inner place. It's a place that's protected and safe and therefore allows us to have all the confidence in the world that our hope is secure. So let me circle back to the question I posed towards the beginning of the sermon. How can we know that God will keep God's promises? We know because God has already done it. We know because God has taken an oath and God does not lie. We know because we have hope anchored in the inner sanctuary where no one can take it from us. If you know me and you know how I preach, you know that I usually give you a story. I like to do that. A real life example of someone who has lived out and through the truth of the scripture that we're studying. Just in the past few weeks, I have communicated with so many of you in person and on the phone and over email and through your prayer cards and your online prayer requests. And one of the threads that has been woven throughout every single one, maybe not every single one, but many of those conversations is that a lot of you are dealing with the effects of broken promises. And so in effect, when I talk about those people who are wounded right now by broken human promises, I'm telling every one of your stories. And even though you may have not seen the fulfillment of God's promise yet because you are in the throes of the aftermath of a broken human promise, I want to leave you with this. God is not human. 
That seems so simple, and it seems like we shouldn't even have to say it, but I think we do. God is not human. No matter how much another human being loves us and we love them, no matter how good our relationship is with other people, at some point, many of those people are going to let us down in big ways and in small ways. Human beings are going to break promises. We just are, all of us. But hear it one more time. God is not human. God does not break a promise. Do you know how many promises God made to humankind that are recorded in Scripture? Take a guess, someone. Throw a number out. No one ever wants to do this. Who said it? 503. 503. I love the specificity. So wrong, but I love the specificity. (laughs) We're short on time. Who said? 83. 83. More than that. 7,487 promises. 7,487 promises made to people. If you count all of them, there's like 8,810 that were promises that were made in its entirety, but 7,487 promises made directly to people. And if you were to look at that exhaustive list of promises, you'll see that they're for all different things like we talked about earlier, rest and peace and hope and, and help for us when we're hurting and salvation. Time and time again, we read in Scripture of God making promises. And time and time again, we read of God fulfilling those promises 7,487 times. Sometimes those promises were kept immediately. Sometimes, like Abraham, we may have to wait 25 years or more before they're realized. It's all in God's timing which we often don't understand and almost always don't like. But as another pastor once said, when we understand that God is never late, we wait differently. When we understand that God is never late, we wait differently. And the difference, friends, is hope. While we are waiting for God's promises to come to fruition, we may cry, but we cry with hope. We may grieve, but we grieve with hope. Every emotion we experience is undergirded with this hope. And ultimately, we wait with hope because we are waiting on a God who loves us tremendously and who we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt will keep every single promise God has made to us. And that is something we can stand firm on forever. Let us pray. God, we're grateful for the promises of Scripture. And even when the things of this world and the people of this world break our hearts, give us the courage to turn to you and to believe with all of our hearts that you keep every promise you made. Help us to turn to you, to trust in you, and to wait with hope that what you say will come to fruition. In your name we pray. Amen.